now. Um, right, so it's, uh, it's our pleasure to welcome uh, Els Heinzalu, who I understand is not a stranger to eFISC, um, and known to many uh, of the people in the audience, uh, but nevertheless, for those who don't know her, so Els got her degree and PhD in, uh, in Tartu, in Estonia, in, uh, in the PhD in 2008. And then I end, oops, so, so somebody, so I'm muting everybody, uh, if you don't mind. So and then after that, uh, she was a postdoc uh, at IFISC from 2008 to 2011, if I'm not mistaken. And subsequently um, at the Niels Bohr Institute in Denmark. Um, also as a postdoc, and then since 2015, she has been a senior researcher at the National Institute for Chemical Physics and Biophysics in Estonia. And uh, the topic for today is languages as complex systems. So the, the screen is yours. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. So uh, I'm really happy to see you, you all, and I'm sorry that we, <laughs> I can't be there with you. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, thank you for the invitation for this online seminar. And uh, yes, the title of my talk is Languages as Complex Systems. And uh, when physicists talk about uh, languages, they, they usually present some uh, models that they have done uh, um, uh, to, to model some problem, mm -hmm. uh, uh, more, usually more abstract. But um, I'm going to talk uh, more real systems, so real languages. So uh, the talk is not going to be very mathematical. And uh, the works uh, that I present, you are due, uh, done already during um, some years. And uh, especially together with Marco Patriarca and Jean-Leo Leonard. Uh, Jean-Leo is a professor of linguistics, actually. And, and also with some other people, but let's say that Marco and Giulio are the, the main collaborators for, for these works. So, uh, I can't go to the next slide now for some reason. Okay. So at uh, EFISC, you know very well what the complex system is uh, and uh, physicists usually define it as a system composed of many components which interact with each other and usually this interaction is, is non-linear and um, the, the system's behavior as a whole is, is unpredictable and one could talk uh, uh, really many lectures about complex systems to, but to make the long story very short um, one can say that um, if the system cannot be described with one or, or a few equations then this is usually the evidence that we are dealing with a complex system. And um, here below you see, uh, I don't know if to, to say that my favorite example of a complex system or my favorite complex system, but yes, a group of children, certainly they are interacting with each other and, and the outcome is, is always unpredictable and surprising. And uh, well, <sighs> You all know that it's really dangerous to ask from a parent how, about uh, his or her children, because then you have to be prepared to, to hear a really long talk. So uh, you can't describe the system with a uh, few equations or words. And uh, one system that uh, also with no doubt can be described with a few equations or even a, with a few pages of equations is a language or, or even worse, a, a system of interacting languages. And so uh, this is what we are going to talk today. Now, I very much like the, the thought expressed by David Krakauer, who is an evolutionary biologist at the Santa Fe Institute. And he has uh, said that uh, complex systems encode long histories. And I very much agree with this, uh, with this uh, uh, idea. And uh, in the case of languages, uh, the evolution of uh, uh, the, the history of languages um, includes uh, evolution of the language faculty, both biological and cognitive, um, also the inner dynamics of the evolution of languages, but uh, also uh, human migration, population dynamics, with no doubt, cultural spreading, 
geophysical conditions that um, I'm not going to describe uh, today the, the Mazatec languages, but uh, for example, in the case of Mazatec languages, the geophysical conditions have also changed very rapidly. Uh, then, of course, also political borders that uh, can change in time, that can protect the languages. Uh, the police, policy in general, in a broader sense, but uh, in particular the language policy, uh, as well as economics and also technological innovations. Uh, for example, today, uh, the, the most influential technological innovation, of course, is, uh, is the internet, but uh, from the old uh, days, uh, also the television and, and uh, the printing of books, for example. And so concerning language and linguistic analysis, uh, the complexity can be understood from at least two different perspectives. One of them is called constitutional complexity or bit complexity. And uh, this is uh, uh, due to the inventories of functional units or structural features, such as, for example, phonemes, morphemes and lexical systems. And later I will make also an example uh, a little bit about this. And, uh, and the other uh, uh, level of complexity uh, or viewpoint is interactional complexity, especially the social interactional complexity called also communal complexity. And uh, this involves intricate modulus of units and features or networks of intricate individuals and aggregates. So um, you see that uh, in the case of uh, uh, languages, the, the, the complexity itself is, is very uh, multi-level and, and, and complicated. So. And uh, furthermore, if we talk about languages, then, then uh, we can actually see them also uh, as uh, existing in different uh, words. Uh, for example, uh, in the real life, uh, the most spoken mother tongue is Chinese. The second most spoken mother tongue is Spanish and then only then English. But if you now go to the online, then uh, half of the web pages use instead English. The second most used language is German, which in the real life uh, doesn't uh, uh, belong even to the, to the then most spoken mother tongues. And, uh, and Chinese is, is only here, it's, uh, it's less than 2%. These data are from 2017. Uh, they have changed a little bit during the last years, but not, uh, not very drastically. Um, and even in, uh, in uh, the real life, uh, then uh, when we speak about uh, the language community, then we, we can, besides the native speakers, take into account also the non-native speakers. And in that case, uh, we see that uh, the English is the, the most spoken language in the world. Uh, however, the difference with the Chinese is, is only uh, a little bit, and, uh, and it's not uh, the same case as in the online uh, uh, situation. Now, besides these uh, big languages, uh, there are also small languages in the world. And uh, it has been estimated that uh, altogether there are around uh, 7,000 languages, or um, in, uh, according to some other databases, uh, 6,000, 6,500. So it's also kind of difficult to, to make the statistics because uh, it's, it's not very precisely defined what, uh, what we consider to be a language or a dialect, and also linguists themselves actually use them pretty much as, as synonyms often. But uh, for me, it's kind of striking to think that uh, only 23 languages of these 7,000 uh, languages account for more than half of the world's population. And 94% uh, of the world's population speaks 6% uh, spe of the world's languages, which means that most of the languages, 94% of them have only a, a small community of speakers. And so um, actually only, as you see from the, the here below, only half of the languages that we have in the world are stable. So it means that the children in the community are learning and using the language. 
and and the other half of languages that we have are uh, whether endangered or or they are called institutional which means that there is a, a probability that in the future they they become endangered and uh, from the endangered languages uh, um, many have less than 1000 speakers which uh, is really a small community because so for example also in estonia we have some schools where you have 1000 uh, students so um, it's a really really small community and uh, the process of, uh, uh, of uh, languages getting dead is uh, uh, is usually not not so fast it takes a uh, place over generations and it starts usually with the uh, communities becoming bilingual and from there the next step is that uh, that uh, uh, there is a shift for the to the more prestigious second language and the prestige of, of a language is something that is closely connected to the economy so if uh, if a language uh, allows you a better equation, education a better job better access to, to money then the many people are, are motivated to to use this language that gives you some advantages and um, yeah a language is considered to be dead when it is no longer a native language of any community and if nobody speaks a language anymore it's uh, it's considered to be extinct and uh, for example uh, latin is a dead language but it's not extinct No, uh, just uh, so for uh, for your general information, um, uh, let's say some words about Estonian. So while in Spain you speak one of the most spoken language of the world in Estonia uh, um, or in the world altogether, there are something like uh, 1.1 million people speaking Estonian. And um, and in general, the, the dialects uh, uh, in Estonia are divided into two big groups, uh, the northern dialects and the uh, southern dialects. And here I have made you a small list of, of words that have the same meaning. And as you can see that they are really different. So it's not only the question of pronunciation or, or some difference, but they are really, really different. But, uh, but for me, it's, uh, I actually, um, before getting to know that they are from the different dialect groups, for me, they were kind of, uh, so to say, normal uh, words that I use every, use every day, and I just use them as synonyms. So somehow, uh, but if you know that they come from dialects, then this, uh, this kind of makes, uh, gives an understanding uh, why it's important to, to have dialects, because they actually make the languages much, uh, much richer. So, um, uh, all these small regions that you see in the in the figure, 100 and more years ago, uh, all these uh, regions had a different dialect, and uh, and uh, they are grouped together for uh, into uh, larger dialect groups. There are all together more or less eight larger dialect groups in Estonia, and nowadays uh, the the most live dialect groups are the Vurumurra or Vuru language and uh, the Mulgi Murra. And in the case of Vuru language, for example, it also can be divided into Western and Eastern dialect groups. And uh, it's also interesting fact that, uh, that uh, actually they, they have observed because uh, there is also an ins institute that studies the, the Vuru language and the, the language is teached in 26 schools, I think, something like this. And it's interesting because somehow they can uh, uh, really follow well the changes in time. And, um, and uh, they have observed that uh, older people uh, speak a much more uh, complicated version of the language, while the younger people make it somehow easier, more similar to the standard Estonian. And they, they use the, the, the loan words. And so somehow it's, uh, it's very fast changing in time. And, and another uh, interesting thing about the Estonian dialects is that um, even if people uh, talk uh, uh, the standard Estonian, then uh, it's very easy to understand if somebody is from the 
from the islands because uh, in the islands they the country actually pronounce the uh, instead of uh, they say uh. so it's uh, it's uh, kind of even if they speak the standard Estonian they uh, somehow uh, you can understand immediately from where they are from which dialect group they are now um, when uh, when physicists uh, uh, investigate the the language they they like to deal with the written text from the books we also have done some works where we analyze the books and and then investigate the zip flow and the origin in, uh, origin of the zip flow or uh, or they like to study the the language uh, used in in internet in social media or in the web pages now instead uh, the the linguists apply the language comparison methods not to written text but to the actual spoken languages and they analyze their phonetic transcriptions into the international phonetic alphabet so here on the right you can see a conclusion of this international phonetic alphabet um, so uh, it's not that they they take into account only the letters but really how they are pronounced for example also from estonian i can make you an example that if i say hal it means gray but if i say hal it means this uh, ice that is formed in the morning and um, it's written in the same way but it's pronounced the the double l is pronounced in a slightly different way and so uh, this uh, phonetic alphabet uh, allows one to write down these differences and um, this uh, transcription is made by the field linguists it's really a, a hard job because uh, first they have to study how to do the job uh, for some years they they get the special training for this and uh, and it may, needs also to be practiced uh, and and sometimes um, um, some linguists field linguists actually like write down the things in a slightly different way because everybody hears the things in a different way but uh, but uh, um, but then they are later also capable to somehow understand what is uh, like the systematic difference and to to smoothen it out and the other part of the work of course is that they actually have to go to these uh, people who live in the in the far away places uh, which uh, which don't have the even the good roads or or uh, not, let's not talk about the internet anything and they they actually have to go to talk to these people to make the recordings to write down the things and uh, and and understand these uh, these uh, small languages that nobody actually knows and uh, for unwritten languages uh, these transcriptions represent uh, the only written sources so um if you want to compare languages then one possibility is to use the string metric and one has to start from the word comparison so uh, the most widely widely known uh, string metric for measuring the difference between two sequences is the Levenstein distance and it was uh, proposed in 1965 and it is defined as the minimum number of edit operations including uh, character addition removal and replacement that is needed to turn a string a into string b or vice versa and here is a small example so uh, considering for example three locations with uh, different dialects in in past country then uh, looking at the word for uh, uh, what in english it means i am then uh, they are let's say nas nice and nice and you see that in the case uh, if you want to, to compare nas and nice then the levenstein distance is one because we only need to have one insertion of i and uh, to get from nice to nice the levenstein distance is also one we have to make one replacement but if we want to get from nas to nice then the Levenstein distance is two because we need to do one insertion and one replacement. And uh, the Levenstein distance is obtained in this way can be organized into a distance uh, matrix called Levenstein matrix. And uh, it is symmetrical and of course the diagonal elements are equal to zero. Now, because longer words have a higher probability of undergoing changes, then it is uh, a good idea to use the relative Levenstein distance and this is obtained by dividing the Levenstein distance by the 
length of the longer word. And in this way, we, we get uh, that the, the value of the relative uh, Levenstein distance is between zero and one. Now, uh, going to language comparison, uh, a simple estimate of a mean distance between languages, i and j, is the arithmetic average of the Levenstein distances between all the pairs of words which uh, have common semantic meaning. So if we have m different words recorded by the field linguists, then the Levenstein distance can be calculated according to this uh, equa uh, equation. And here, a, i, j, k represent the words with the kth meaning that are recorded in the ith and j uh, places or for the ith and j languages. Now, this would be the ideal situation. In real life, it is that, um, that often uh, we want to analyze n dialects, but uh, for some dialect, we have some words and for the other dialect, we have some other words. So we do actually not have all the pairs of words for all the, the languages with the same meaning, but, uh, but we have a, a smaller number M. So our database is incomplete, but we still want to use this database because we have to do something. And, and we don't want to leave out the, 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 um, uh, the words that we don't have for all the languages. So the simple thing is that we just have to replace M by MIJ. So uh, for, for different um, words, we have different statistics, but um, uh, for different uh, languages, but, uh, but it's okay. One can still, uh, still uh, uh, use this data in this way. And, uh, and then using these average levels and distances, uh, we can uh, uh, once again, organize them into N times N matrix, Levenstein matrix. And, uh, and this matrix can be then be used to visualize and understand the structure of the language family. And uh, to make an, an example, uh, so let's look at the Basque dialects that we already uh, used to make a small example. And uh, when we have computed the Levenstein distances, average Levenstein distances, we can make the network and, uh, and usually in the case of uh, languages, it's good to, to uh, use the geographical background. So the, the points here correspond to the, to the actually actual places of the, of the dialects and the links between them uh, uh, correspond uh, to the Levenstein distance. The, the thicker is the, the line, the, the more similar the two languages are. Uh, and uh, you see that uh, we observe like uh, three big, big, big uh, and strong groups. And, um, uh, <clears throat> and one could be happy with this. But now uh, often linguists actually, they consider some changes to be more important and some changes to be less important. So uh, it's better to use instead of non-weighted less than distance uh, and let work to use a weighted uh, network. And uh, weighting uh, is decided by the linguist because they know to do this job. We physicists don't know. Uh, and the weighting has to be uh, done respect to some uh, reference dialect. And in the case of Basque, uh, Basque language is uh, the, the reference uh, language uh, uh, we took is, uh, was the standard Basque. Now, if you compare uh, the non-weighted and weighted uh, networks, they are rather similar. So we still like uh, can observe the three uh, groups, but the inner structure of these, uh, these subgroups are a little bit different. Uh, I'm not going to discuss all these linguistic uh, details uh, that, um, that can be understood from these things. It's, it's not important for, uh, for physicists so much. But um, to compare the, the results, I, I have put here also the, the picture the, that is provided by the, the linguists for the Basque languages. And you see that it actually coincides rather well with, with the one that we have observed. So we have the, the Western dialect group, 
the central dialect group, and uh, for sure we have also this uh, lower Navarrese Lapurdian dialect group, as well as uh, uh, we have this Soletin group. Now, if this upper Navarrese that linguists have proposed um, is more like a separate group, or it could be considered to be together one group with the central dialects. Well, this is, I think, a little bit the question of imagination. And, uh, um, and uh, so I, I, I don't know. I would say that this is more like one group. But if one wants to see, it could be also distinguish another group. But, uh, but this, this is not so, so important. We more or less have, have the picture with what also linguists agree. Um, now to make another example, uh, let's discuss very shortly the, the Celtal languages. The Celtal languages uh, or language is a Mayan language that is spoken in the highlands of uh, Chiapas in southern Mexico. And, uh, and uh, they are divided uh, into C, uh, three subgroups. Uh, Northern, Central, and Southern Celtal. Um, now, when we have studied uh, the Celtal languages, we uh, have, besides the phonology, looked also morphology and lexicology. Uh, now, uh, looking at the lexicology, one can actually see that uh, it's pretty nicely seen that there is the Northern, the Central, and the Southern groups. And uh, this now here is uh, the similarity index network. Uh, but if we um, lower the, the threshold, then we see that uh, the, the northern and the central groups are like more similar, and the southern is, uh, is a little bit more different from the, from the other languages. Uh, and the same is valid also in the case of morphology. But instead, if you look at the phonology, then we see that uh, the central and the southern groups uh, like uh, form a strong single group, uh, while the while the northern uh, group remains separate. So, kind of the grammar and the phonology and lexicon in this case uh, give us different pictures. And from the point of view of linguistics, this is uh, very interesting. And uh, finally. I, I would also like to tell you something about uh, Numic languages. Uh, this language family belongs to the uto azteca language family. And uh, Numic languages are thought to have originated from a single proto-language. And the speakers of the proto-Numic were by nature highland people. And they originated from the region called uh, the Numic homeland. So, this uh, small region here. So here is uh, San Francisco and here is uh, Santa Fe Institute somewhere. Now, uh, Lam has proposed a new mixed breed hypothesis. And this, uh, this uh, says that uh, the division into the groups appeared already when the, uh, when the new people were in the new homeland. And then together with the spreading of the, of the people, also the, the language is diffused across the Great Basin. And this took place something like year 1000. And, and they actually don't know what caused this migration. Um, but uh, it is uh, known that yes, very often the, the language spread takes place together with the, with the diffusion of people. And um, also numic languages are divided into three groups. The Western languages, which consist of Mono and Northern Payuta. The, the Central languages, uh, which is uh, Banamint, uh, Shoshone, and Comanche languages. And, uh, and nowadays the Comanche uh, language is kind of uh, isolated here, farther away. And geographically, it could be thought to be rather in the same group is the Southern languages, but uh, from the archeological findings, it is uh, known that the Shoshone and Comanche people uh, used to be uh, a same group of people. Um, and the Southern group, yes, uh, uh, consists of Kawaiso, uh, Southern Paiuta and Uta, 
And besides, uh, there is also a, another language, but we didn't have data, separate data for this language, so we didn't consider this, uh, this one. Now, the, the results from the Levenstein distances are the following. So you see that, yes, Northern Paiuta and Mono uh, make one uh, uh, group for sure, as well as Shoshone and Comanche. Now, if we uh, increase the threshold value, then uh, we will also observe the Uta and South and Bayuta, uh, group. But at the same time, uh, we also observe the links appearing between Comanche and Northern Bayuta as well as Shoshone and Northern Bayuta. And increasing even more, this gets even more, um, the, the dialects here get even more connected to each other. And so um, somehow, uh, Actually, one could argue that instead of uh, having uh, the division into three groups in this way, the Western and Central languages could be considered as one big group and then the Southern languages as another group. However, um, a question is about the Kawaiso because Kawaiso should belong to the same group if you and uh, Southern Bayuta, but, but the Levenstein distance doesn't give us this picture and Levenstein distance uh, Based on the Levenstein distance, one can also make the dendrogram as well as minimum spanning tree and other representations. But all, all, all this uh, shows that uh, the Kawaiso is like not in the southern dialect group. Now, another method that I would like to, to introduce to you that I think while perhaps from the Levenstein distance, so many of you have heard and historical plotometry is not so well known. Now, uh, the, the family tree model is, is a major approach that has been used by the linguists to, to interpret and visualize the historical relationships among languages. And uh, in the tree model of language evolution, it is assumed that the proto-language develops independently in each branch uh, subcommunity. But instead, uh, the wave theory takes into account that the languages as entities evolve continuously while they interact with each other. This means that innovations that are born in one community spread to other neighboring communities. And, uh, and this is uh, very well observed in, in, the, in the real systems. Now, um, wave theory has, uh, has influenced also or inspired the uh, the, the historical plotometry. And uh, this uh, method is based on the dialect-based comparison of innovations. Uh, so uh, it means that uh, if we have some languages, then for a given pair of languages, we can distinguish uh, two types of innovations. Uh, exclusively shared innovations, which means that uh, it's uh, innovations that are owned by both languages A and B, but not by some other language C and, and uh, conflicting innovations, meaning that uh, these are the innovations that languages A and B do not share. And, and the innovations all are uh, innovations compared to the proto-language. So it's not that we are directly comparing two languages uh, between themselves, but we are making the comparison actually with the proto-language. Uh, now, if we know the number of shared innovations and uh, the number of conflicting innovations, then one can calculate the cohesiveness, uh, which means the relative strength of the grouping between two languages. And, uh, and then we can also calculate the subgroupiness. Now, it's important that while in the, uh, in the equation for calcul calculating the subgroupiness, we, we, have, uh, we have to take into account the exclusively shared innovations, then in calculating the cohesiveness, it's, it's uh, just shared innovations. So they don't have to be exclusively shared. They, they are just uh, innovations that, um, that the languages we want to see the, the groupiness in the end that they share. So uh, to make an example, uh, so here now, A and B, if they have exclusively shared innovation, this means that C doesn't have this uh, innovation, but shared innovation is that also C can have this innovation. So all three languages can have the innovation. 
Now, in this example, however, uh, what is made here, when we have three languages, A, B, and C, then uh, we, we, they all have only exclusively shared innovations. So for this uh, here, the numbers uh, are the same. And, uh, and A and B have 12 exclusively shared innovations. H, uh, A and C have four, and B and C have two of them. And, uh, and now, uh, in this case, the exclusively shared innovations means that, um, that uh, the, for the other one, they are conflicting innovations. Um, and so we can compute the subgroupiness. And then on the basis of these numbers, one can draw the lines around the groups. And, and if one makes the lines uh, thick, uh, the thicker, the, the larger is the, the subgroupiness, uh, then one can visualize very easily the, the picture that we have. And <clears throat> yes, in the case of the numic languages, the glottometric uh, diagram is the following. So you, you see once again here that the Northern Paiute and Mono make a really strong group, as well as the Comanche and Shoshone. And, and then we have also a rather strong subgroup uh, of Northern Paiute and Shoshone. But um, and in this picture, we have uh, drawn only the 24 strongest uh, subgroups. So we don't uh, draw them all, but only the stronger ones. Um, uh, and if you, if you compare now the, the picture of, of the historical glottometry with the one from the Levenstein distance, then uh, you can see that in general, it, the results are like similar. But now what is the difference is that in the, from the historical glottometry, the Kawaiso language actually uh, mm, seems to be more closely connected to the Southern Bayuta and Uta. So the, 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 the picture is more similar to the one proposed by the linguists. And so when in physics and mathematics, we are like used to the idea that, or the situation that if you, if you apply the correct methods, in a correct way, then uh, if you solve a problem, you, you usually get the, the same result. And then you see that in linguistics, somehow the situation is, is more complicated and, and you can um, sometimes get uh, slightly different results. Yes, and um, if, you, if you are interested about the topic, then last year we, with Marco and Jean Leo, published uh, also a book uh, titled, uh, with the title Languages in Space and Time Models and Methods from Complex Systems Theory. And, and there uh, you can see uh, all these examples I made uh, today for you, uh, and, uh, and some longer um, explanations also from the point of view of linguistics and also some other examples. And, um, and this um, revealing language groups is only one half of the, uh, of the, of the book and the other half is dealing uh, with, uh, with the problems of how to model the language dynamics so more uh, mathematical uh, uh, models. And, um, and also uh, information for, uh, for younger people so just this year, we have started a, a new five-year lasting project, learning processes in language dynamics. So uh, if somebody is looking uh, now or, or in, during the last uh, next year's uh, postdoc position, then you can write whether to Marco or to me and, uh, and ask some information. So this is uh, what I was thinking to tell you today. And I don't know if you have some questions or, or comments. So uh, uh, thank you for this for this talk. <coughs> um, so this is open uh, for discussion, questions, comments, and as usual, just unmute yourself and uh, and speak if anybody has any questions. <clears throat> yeah, I do have one, Stefano here. Um, Go yeah, ahead. Very, very interesting uh, presentation. <coughs> uh, a very new field for me, but really interesting. Um, I was wondering uh, whether you are connecting uh, with the community of, you know, linguists and uh, people working on humanities. 
So people studying languages more from the standpoint of humanities, whether you are getting back to them with your learnings uh, using physics um, tools and, uh, and approaches, and, uh, and what type of exchange have you seen to be possible between the two communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually uh, mentioned it in the very beginning. So Jean-Leo is actually a professor of linguistics. So he's a really linguist. So sometimes it's also difficult to talk to him because for example, our understanding about what is a model is completely different, but okay, we have accepted his understanding and, and, and we managed to communicate. And, and also the, the goal of this book was actually to kind of make the bridge. So somehow to, to, to make the, the point of view of linguists and, and physicists and mathematicians uh, more um, to, to get into the same point somewhere. And, um, and also we have collaborated through the, the connections of Jean-Leo with some other linguists, uh, Darlieu, for example. So um, I don't say it's always so easy, but it's possible to, to actually collaborate. And, and Marco actually also some years ago uh, was invited to participate uh, a conference, uh, uh, a, a linguistic conference that took place in Italy. So um, somehow I see that there, there is some, some interest also from the point of view of linguists. And actually we, we met Jean-Leo in, um, in a conference that took place uh, in Estonia already in 2008. And this was also a linguistic conference. And, and uh, he, he just uh, listened to the talk by Marco and, and uh, got very excited. And, and then that's how the collaboration started. Okay, uh, David has the hand up. So do you want to ask or comment? I uh, thanks for the interesting talk. <coughs> Um, I would like to ask you about the dialects um, calculations uh, because, okay, as you know, um, the findings or the, 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 the groups that you find depends very much on, uh, first on the data, on the corpus that you, are, that you are studying. As you know, here we use automatic corpus uh, from Twitter that, of course, they have their, I mean, its own bias due to the, but maybe this corpus is not representative. <coughs> However, there is no intervention from our side. I mean, it's, the corpus is what, what we see in, in Twitter. Now, I would like to, to know what kind of corpus you use to, to calculate these, these distances and uh, what kind of biases do, do you have in or do you detect in this, in this corpus? Um, just to be sure that I give you the, I, I answer your question. What do you mean exactly by, by corpus? Well, you, you calculate the distance, um, if, if I understood well, between words, okay? Mm -hmm. And these words are extracted from some, let's say, geographical locations. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, this is, this, the, I mean, these are data, which, uh, I mean, somebody had to go there or maybe exactly. uh, detect what is, yeah, exactly. So the point is, uh, I mean, from which data did you take this, uh, all this information? Is it uh, something like, for instance, in our case, uh, this data is something that, I mean, it's, it's I mean, you, you, we, we construct our text, or uh, let's say, um, we um, find all these dialect groups and so on from all the conversations people naturally have in Twitter. But in your case, what kind of text or what kind of information do you use? So um, the, the data that we have uh, used mm. are coming uh, directly from the uh, field linguists. So they have gone to the, to the real places and, uh, and uh, make the interviews with people. So uh, some, in some cases, we have had even that we have like uh, more than one database. And then we have merged them together to have more statistics, more words. So um, I also mentioned that sometimes one has to then uh, like um, clean the data because, or some people have, uh, you, one can understand, this is, this is the work that is usually done by the linguists. So the, the, the initial work of the database. So we usually then take already the database <coughs> that is so to say uh, ready and clean but just to describe you shortly, 
So uh, the linguists uh, try to understand if, uh, if the database is constructed on two different databases, for example, that they try to understand if these uh, field linguists have made the work, the recordings uh, in the same way, mm -hmm. the transcription to the uh, IPA. And, and then uh, very often um, it's also important they, I, I'm sure the linguist could explain you better this thing, things, but um, they sometimes they, they still make further cleaning because they need to have uh, uh, some certain forms of the words. So they may lay, uh, leave out some parts of the words that they say that this is not important. It's like uh, just uh, the ending of the word that we don't care, we need uh, the root. So um, it's a little bit also depends on what, uh, what one is looking for. Um, yeah, I mean, just a little criticism to these kind of methods, not your methods, but the, the uh, um, I mean, this linguistic pre-processing of data that at the end of the day, when you, um, let's say, uh, select one um, attribute of this data or not, uh, somehow you introduce some bias and then you get some group that should, let's say, naturally merge from the data. It's not something that you have to... No, actually, the, the idea is uh, 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 the opposite. Uh, the idea is not to have the bias. <laughs> okay. So, but yeah. yeah, I'm sure that um, some linguists could explain you much better these details because I'm I'm actually not trained in these things and and I there are too many things that I actually don't understand. And if you do your part of the job, you you just at some point you give up and say, okay, this is your job. You you say this is important, so we do as you say it. Thanks. Okay, um, Emilio has the hand up. So, do you want? Yes, to thank you for the for the talk. Yeah, I just I have a couple of questions. One is just a curiosity. Is um, you say that the 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 Compilation of the phonetic uh, phonetic um, trans translation of languages to international phonetic languages done by by field linguists. I just wonder want to, to know what is the status of machine learning techniques to do this automatically. So it's possible to take recordings and then to to make the an automatic transcription to phonetic system. Is this already um, being do done? Or is still is people are still far from doing that or? Do you know what is the status of this possible um, method? I, I don't know exactly uh, what is the situation. I, I think um, it's not very much used still. Uh, the, the data that we have used uh, are not uh, very fresh. They are from the 60s uh, usually or, or, or even earlier or a little bit later. Um, but but uh, I, I think uh, it's uh, somehow uh, linguists are also very often like a little bit conservative. So, so I think that it's still very much, um, of course, nowadays they have the recording uh, equipment and everything and, and they can also like um, uh, see, see how the pronunciations. Uh, but um, uh, machine learning, I, I doubt that uh, this is uh, used already very much. Thanks, and I have a second question. It's also about, it's a methodolo methodological one. Um, it's, well, it's, it's, I think it's interesting. I, I didn't know that these uh, different methods, the, this uh, family tree method, and then the, this glottometric, uh, well, different, different views, and I, I understand that they give different results because they are, they are looking at different things. So it's interesting to compare the things. But just, just another, a related, related point is that in the in network theory, there are many methods to, to extract communities from the networks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you are using here, you have presented us something, some one related to percolation. So you, you move a threshold and see when the, the network splits. And also you have some other, other public trees and this kind of things. Is there uh, is anyone looking at which uh, community, that, there are many other community detection methods in the literature. Is there anyone looking at some, which is the, commu the, the community detection method that best fits best to, to the linguistic needs or perhaps there is no single one or what, what do you have to say about that? Um, um, 
Yeah, I'm sure somebody has studied it. Uh, now, um, in the case of Numic, we didn't stick to the, to the ge geography, but uh, very often we have found that actually it is very convenient to, to stay in the geographical background because somehow, um, yeah, it, it gives you like the, the picture of the, so to say, real, real system. But yeah, of course, uh, one could always uh, try to compare the different uh, methods. I agree. Thanks. Any <clears throat> other comments or questions? Or I have one question. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Hi. Uh, I in in uh, in economy, people study the correlation between companies. And they, they construct correlation matrices, they construct distances, and they analysis the distances in several ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and of course, you can obtain different results. Different, but there is <coughs> one analysis which I don't know if it, it, it has been done in this case, which is basically look at what part of the correlation is just because of fluctuations or noise, what part is random, and what part is not. Basically, the idea is that you take the, the correlation matrix or the distances or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you took the eigenvalues and you compare the eigenvalues with the ones that a random matrix would have, a mm -hmm. random matrix with some restrictions, okay? And then whatever the eigenvalues are similar to those of a random matrix, you consider this is just a factor of fluctuations or mm -hmm. whatever, and you keep only the, the eigenvalues that are far away from whatever it is a random matrix, and from those eigen, the eigenvectors of the eigenvalues, from those associated eigenvectors, you reconstruct a new correlation matrix, which is clean. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I wondered if this sort of techniques could be, in, in your case, could be helpful in, say, because if this is data that is recorded by somebody at hand, at some point, look, whistling at the people, I know that there could be some sort of errors or fluctuations or mm -hmm. to that. So it could be a way to, I don't know, cleaning the data. I think it would be interesting to look at this, yes, to see if, uh, if something comes out. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Any... Anybody else with a question or a comment or? Um... So I had one, this, you Akawa, right? At the beginning you said complex systems encode long histories. Mm -hmm. And then initially my reaction was, well, no, that's not, not all complex systems do that, but then I'm not sure anymore. So I, I don't know whether I agree or don't agree, but, but do, can you explain what that statement means? I, I wasn't, I'm not sure I understand the statement. Or what is it? Yeah. What can, is I, it? <laughs> can I can I ask you uh, uh, one question from you? So what uh, what would be the example that you make that uh, don't have a long history? But I can make it for me. A complex system is a system that okay generates somehow macroscopic behavior that you cannot explain based on studying one component alone, right, or one constituent alone. So you can take any model that is there that will generate, I mean, any, you can take the voter model, any game theory model, <laughs> any model, any language model, the model itself, what, what does it mean for a model to encode long history? So I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Well, well, you see, it was, um, first of all, you have to uh, bear in mind who said it. It was a, an evolutionary biologist. Yeah, well, okay, right. So he has his point of view. Um, now, um, it also depends a little bit um, on, uh, from which level you look at the problem. Because, I mean, for example, uh, certainly if you talk about languages, then, uh, then you have to admit that there is the long history that has influenced the languages uh, to become as, uh, as they have become, uh, the, their dynamics. So uh, yes, you can also, uh, for, for sure, make some examples of complex systems that don't have the long history. But also in that case, it, it, it might, I don't say in all the cases, it might uh, depend uh, on the, from which point of view you look at it. 
and and also the time scale also for example if you talk about the the, the people how we behave right now is it uh, just you know the influence of last five days or is it uh, a longer history that has um, has made us as we are because you know so a lot of um, uh, how people behave is coming from from a, somewhere very very past where we still were like perhaps not even humans so it it is a it is a little bit philosophical point in, in my opinion yeah, yeah. but I, I guess i can agree with the statement that many complex systems describe processes that encode a long history that i guess i can agree with this but i'm not sure it's a defining feature of like every if it doesn't encode a long history then it's not a complex system i don't think no I agree no with for sure okay, it's well. not uh, like the the definition or or some 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 must it's just um, i am um, especially in the in the constant context of languages i i, I liked it actually hmm. this uh, this idea of his so i must say i must add this is one of many statements of david krakowitz that i do not understand <laughs> um, and I'm not sure it's, yeah, okay. So Tobias, maybe uh, we can say that complex systems in general are non-Markovian. Ooh. <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are experts in the audience. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think that non-Markovian properties is intrinsic or not, because it depends on the number of variables that you have. Mm. Many properties are non-Markovian, you increase the number of variables and you can perform your. Not always, Peter, not always. Not always, but I say many, many, many. Not always, but many. But I, I would say always. Well, if you increase the number of variables in infinite variables, then it does. Yeah. If you have a field, a many field, and, 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 I don't know. But, but many standard systems become Markovian when you increase the number of variables. In the same way that that when you have something which is a probability which is not positive, you increase the number of probability or the number of variables, and you have a p positive probability or whatever. So, uh, uh, what I would say about this uh, history is that if you have a system that does not recall the history, is either the system a very simple system. Or it is in a stationary state, which has forgotten the previous history. So in that sense, I don't know if complex systems has to have a long history or, or be uh, aware of a long history, but I would say that a system that is in a state which does not remember anything on its, on its history is either because in a, is it in a stationary state or it is a very simple system. Which is completely different of being Markovian or not. Any, okay, any, any other questions or, or comments for else or? No, doesn't seem to be the case. Well, in that case, thank you again for this uh, talk and for being with us and <coughs> Now it's always this unfortunate situation that we sort of basically now have to stop the session. This, this is a bit strange, but uh, okay. the only Thank way to do it. For the invitation. Thank you. Thanks Thank again. You Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Ciao. Bye. <coughs>